Good morning, um, Chair, Assistant Chairwoman Duran and members of Government Affairs Committee. My name is Max Carter, M-A-X-C-A-R-T-E-R. -E I'm Assemblyman for Assembly District 12 on the east side of Las Vegas. And I'm here today to present AB 222. This is another bill about schools. As we all know, there's big headline things that splash all the time regarding schools in Nevada. Everything from, you know, outrageous executive compensation at the top of the ladder to um, school teachers having to pay for supplies out of their own pocket. So all of those things catch the big things and make it into the news. I'm here today to talk about the yeoman, the people that show up every day to help our kids through the education process. We're talking about education support personnel, people like the attendance clerk in the front office. We're talking about the custodians, which all of us that have had children know that sometimes that custodian is that link that your child has to the bigger establishment of the school. It's talking about paraeducators, those people who really give more than we really realize when we have a child with disabilities that, we're, that the districts are mainstreaming. They're helping them navigate the system. The security guards, the technical services, the bus drivers. And I wanna make it clear, what we're talking about here are full-time employees. There's been some fear-mongering put out there by a couple of policy institutes claiming that this bill is about giving part-time employees full benefits. No, this is about full-time employees that the system, for some reason, has been miscalculating or there's a deficit in the statute. We're still working on that. So what we're talking about primarily is these people I just said, ESPs, education support personnel, that work in a nine-month school. And the teachers that work in that school, that they work with and help facilitate the education, they are full-time employees also. The teachers are receiving a full pension credit in PERS, as is proper, because they're full-time employees. These employees are only receiving approximately 0.75 to 0.8, sometimes 0.9% of a pension credit every year, as if they were part-time employees, but they're not. They're full-time employees who are not eligible to draw unemployment during the summer break. So that's what we're trying to do here is correct an inequity in the system and create parity across the board for these full-time employees. And I know, I've said that a lot. It, it really irritates me when people denigrate these people that are working, facilitating the education of our students, of our children, by trying to paint them as part-time employees. They're not. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Daly to walk us through the bill, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. When you ready. Good morning, Madam. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. Uh, first of all, uh, NSCA would like to thank Assemblymember Max Carter uh, for sponsoring AB 222. Uh, as he introduced, AB 222 is intended to correct an inequity in the computation of credit for service for school district employees in the public employment retirement system. Specifically, many education support professionals and PERS report not receiving a full year of service credit, even though they work a job that is comparable in hours to teacher members of the system who do receive a full year of service credit. Education support professionals are the backbone of our public education system, keeping schools running while ensuring students are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. 
ESPs include paraprofessionals, bus drivers, nutrition workers, custodians, IT workers, clinical aides, administrative assistants, library aides, and building and grounds maintenance. While critical to the operation of schools, education support professionals tend to be at the bottom of district pay scales, with some ESPs making as little as $11 an hour and an overwhelming majority making less than a living wage. Last year, for example, over 1,600 CCSD workers, mostly ESPs, were enrolled in Medicaid. Education support professionals usually reflect the Nevada communities they serve. About half of ESPs across the state are people of color. Far too often, when thinking about our schools, education support professionals are relegated or forgotten. For example, Nevada has a teacher recruitment and retention task force, yet there are hundreds upon hundreds of education support professional vacancies right now. There's a bill here in the Assembly to create an advisory committee on teacher safety, while two of the most vulnerable positions in schools are specialized program teaching assistants and bus drivers, ESP positions. Yesterday, the Senate Majority Leader introduced a bill for educator raises, leaving out about half of all ESPs in the state. In contract negotiations, it's not uncommon for a school district to, to bargain with the teacher unit first and then, they, and then say they have less available when bargaining with the ESP unit. And for years, NSEA has heard from education support professionals about this inequity in the computation of service credit under PERS. An example, you could have a paraprofessional in the same classroom as a teacher working with the same students during the same hours, and at the end of the year, that teacher earns a full year of service credit, while that paraprofessional ends up somewhere between three quarters and 0.9. Here's the, uh, I've uh, submitted uh, in uh, this exhibit a PERS report for a full-time specialized programs teaching assistant in the Clark County School District. While working full-time for five years between 2018 and 22, this employee's accrued less than four and a half hours of service, while her teacher colleague accrued the full five years. I will submit this, just received it. Um, it's uh, a paraprofessional from the Carson City uh, School District who's worked over 23 years, but has accrued uh, just around 19 years uh, of service credit. NSCA has very much appreciated our conversations with PERS about this issue, and our understanding of the cause of this discrepancy is evolving. While initially we thought uh, that it had to do with the definition of working the full school year, uh, which the original language of AB 222 is based on, we now believe it's actually related to uh, the total hours worked in a workday. Uh, Either way, we are optimistic we can reach agreement on amended language in AB 222 that addresses the issue of inequity in the computation of service credit and is fair uh, to all parties. Uh, Thank you very much. I believe uh, we're also joined uh, by NSEA Executive Director and ESEA Executive Director Brian Lee uh, down in Grant Sawyer, uh, who will be available for questions. Shall the committee have any? Thank you. And does Mr. Lee have any presentation or no, just for questions? Perfect. Thank you. At this time, I'll go ahead and open it. Members, any questions? I see Assemblyman DeLong, then Assemblyman Taylor, then Assemblyman Kolek. Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I hear that you're being, you're very emphatic about this is just covering full-time employees, which I, I get that. But then I look at the uh, the language under section one, or sorry, section two five one B, and it uses the term on call basis. And at least in the private sector, the term on call basis implies a very part time position. And if you could clarify that with me, for me, I'd appreciate it. Brian Lee, you want that one? <laughs> I will take that one. <clears> Through <throat> the chair to the assembly member. <clears throat> the Please feel free to go directly to the members. Thank you. Uh, to the assembly member. Uh, this is Brian Lee for the record. Um, the language, as we said, was evolving. Uh, the language that included on call was based upon uh, initial conversations with our members concerning what we believe the problem to be. We have now met with PERS, and we believe that there will be amended language that will not cite to on call employees, but will instead uh, deal with the number of hours an employee works in a day. And whether that applies to an on call employee or not depends upon how often that they would work. Um, so the, as we as was presented, the language is evolving, and we hope to have amended language soon. 
Yes, go ahead. Um, appreciate that clarification. So you're talking about hours per day. Is there still going to be the, the months per year so that it's equivalent to what teachers do? Or is it just going to be looking at how much someone works during the day? Ryan Lee, for the record again, to the assembly member, um, if you don't mind. Um, we will be taking a look at the nine months is within existing law. Uh, it refers to a, a nine month uh, being a full time schedule, um, working full time nine months that that equaling one year's of uh, PERS credit. So there will be likely some citation to nine months for those nine month employees. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If, if I could, through the chair, uh, section two, uh, subsection two, uh, has a multiplier of one and one third. Uh, I, I think that that language probably will remain uh, in any amendment that comes forward. Thank you, Assemblyman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks to all of you for bringing this forward. Um, is this a, um, a question? in terms of um, uh, the, the, re the recruiting, and you mentioned some really important positions, Assemblyman, um, in the district, bus drivers and teacher aides, and, and I know there's you know, special ed assistants and so on. Um, across the state, any, uh, uh, this can be for you, uh, Mr. Daly, because you're, you're, you have a statewide presence, um, but what do you know about the, the vacancy rates in these positions, and um, is, is this having any kind of an impact, um, the lack of that in, in those positions that you can share with the committee? Thank you, uh, Assemblymember Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. Uh, I, I'll just start with uh, bus drivers, and I think, Assemblymember, when you might have been President uh, Taylor, uh, you, I think, dealt with a shortage of bus drivers in the Washoe County School District. It was severe as well, not just in Washoe and in Clark, but in rural uh, districts as well. Uh, there have been many changes that boards of trustees have had to make, make to transportation. Um, and so that bus driver uh, shortage issue uh, is real uh, and likely will continue. Um, there are shortages across job classes, though. Uh, you know, we talk and see the headlines around the teacher uh, vacancies, but uh, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds. It might approach 1,000 uh, vacancies in ESP positions uh, currently uh, in the middle of uh, the school year. So it's serious. I think the causes of that are numerous. Um, obviously, uh, pay, uh, you know, compensation is a, a leading cause. Um, work conditions uh, also uh, impact that. Um, but overall, I mean, we'll hear from some education support professionals uh, during public comment uh, in this item. I think that there's an overall issue of a feeling of respect mm -hmm. or disrespect. And I think, you know, if you uh, pull your you know, retirement, and you see that you basically worked the same as, you know, your colleague, uh, and you're getting a percentage uh, of that service credit. Uh, I think that speaks to kind of this ongoing issue of feeling, you know, like you're second class, uh, and that certainly is a job morale issue and ultimately a retention uh, issue. Uh, strong retirement benefits are one of uh, the, you know, reasons to work. Uh, in uh, the public sector, uh, we are very fond of, of, of PERS generally, um, but I think that this issue, uh, if it gets remedied, it will, it will help more. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblyman Koenig. Madam Chair, I have more of a comment than a question. Would that be okay? Thank you, Assemblyman, for bringing this forward. I, I just want to share an experience I had being on the, on the school board and being president of the State School Board Association, I do feel that the classified employees were always treated a little bit as second-class citizens. There was multiple times when we were in severe budget crunches where the proposal was brought forth, let's go to a four-day work week where the teachers would still maintain their salaries the same, but all the classified employees would take a 20% cut. We never had to go to that, but it was proposed and argued for quite hard. And so to see, you know, one section that the teachers couldn't, couldn't do their job without the classified employees and to treat them as second class, I don't, I don't think it was fair. Um, so I think this is equitable and thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Assemblyman Gonzalez. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, as an educator, I really appreciate this, this bill, and I see those real-life conversations. Um, I have two questions. One, do you think that this would help with retention and recruitment in the long run and help fill those vacancies? And then number two, I don't think it was clear just by the language. I'm just a little confused. Um, would this include substitute teachers? Thank you. Assemblymember Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. I think, uh, you know, in response to Assemblymember Taylor's question, I do think that it would help with uh, retention. Um, honestly, with recruitment, I think it might be a little technical uh, to have a big impact on recruitment, but I think it would uh, help with educator uh, retention uh, as retirement is something that you tend to look at, kind of, you know, start paying more attention to mid-career uh, and towards your end of career as opposed to, you know, when you're younger, you, you don't think you're ever going to get older, and you do. Um, uh, and <laughs> it happens to the best of us. Uh, so in terms of substitute teachers, no. Um, this language uh, is written uh, to impact uh, members of PERS. Uh, currently, substitute uh, teachers are not members of PERS, so uh, it would not impact substitute teachers, uh, with the caveat that um, there are substitute, substitute teachers who are long-term, who end up uh, becoming full-time teachers. Uh, of course, those uh, do become members of PERS, but this language wouldn't impact them as teachers uh, are already accruing a full year of service credit for the school year worked. Thank you, Assemblyman Thomas, and then Assemblyman De Silva. Good morning, Chair, and thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation and, um, you know, the concerns that we have with our support staff in our schools. My question actually is, when does this become effective? Because I don't see that here in the bill. Max Carter, Assembly District 12, for the record. Assemblywoman Thomas. This is one of those issues where the more we dig into it, the more complicated it gets. And so I'm not really sure at this uh, point in time. Carter, uh, I actually have uh, as our legal counsel, Attorney Kevin Powers, and he can help answer that question. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Kevin Powers, General Counsel, LCB Legal Division. Uh, there's a general statute that applies to all legislation that if a specific effective date is not specified in the bill, the effective date would be the October 1st following the end of the legislative session. However, I would recommend since the committee would be considering amendments that because this bill would affect the school year, that the effective date should be considered to be potentially July 1st of 2023. So it's in effect before the next school year. Um, begins. And I'd also like to mention to make it clear as well is that there's a presumption of prospective application to all legislation and that this legislation will only ap apply prospectively beginning on its effective date and forward and would not affect the calculation of service credit in prior years served by these types of employees. Thank you, Madam Chair. What he said. When uh, Mr. Powers is in the room, that's usually the answer. <laughs> but, uh, as I'm in De Silva. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Daly, for an excellent presentation, and Assemblyman Carter for bringing up this bill. Uh, my question is this. So, you know, I'm a, I have to take a leave of absence as a, a teacher from the Clark County School District to come and serve here. I have a sub now uh, as, uh, on special assignment. I think they call SPAs, a, special, a sub on special assignment, uh, who's now t doing a five, five month sort of stint there uh, with, the, with the school district. My question is uh, would these uh, 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 be retirement benefits uh, actually? Uh, help a, an individual like that who's taken on a long-term position, almost a full-time position in some ways, uh, uh, in, in these sort of uh, pos uh, situations where you're taking five, six, eight-month gigs. Thank you. Max Carter, for the record. And as w we are not addressing substitute teachers, this bill is not addressing that situation at all. So, and as like was stated earlier, if that position that that person is feeling, filling turns over into a full-time position, yeah, it might. But right now, that person you just described is a substitute teacher, and that is not what we are discussing with this bill. 
think, and I would encourage legislators that are interested in this topic to possibly consider this for future legislation too, um, because it's definitely an issue that's impacting our education system. Um, are there any other questions from members? All right, then at this time, I will go ahead um, and invite those wishing to testify in support of AB 222. And I will remind everyone that you'll have two minutes to speak, but then if you, you know, if somebody ahead of you says exactly what you were gonna say, please feel free to just say ditto or what he said, um, and we'll get that reflected on the record. Thank you.